Good day, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the Tupperware Brands Corporation First Quarter 2021 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 1 on your telephone. Please be advised that today's conference is being recorded. If you require any further assistance, please Please press star zero. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Jane Gerard, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you. Welcome to Tupperware Brands' first quarter 2021 earnings conference call. With me on today's call are Miguel Fernandez, our President and CEO, and Sandra Harris, our Chief Financial and Operations Officer. Earlier this morning, we issued a press release announcing our financial results for the first quarter ended March 27, 2021. The press release is available on our company website on our Investor Relations page. We will begin with our safe harbor statement. During the course of today's call, we will make forward-looking statements that are subject to risks and uncertainties as described in our press release and in our SEC filings. You should listen to today's call in the context of that information. We will also discuss some of our results for the quarter on a non-GAAP basis. Reconciliation between GAAP and non-GAAP measures can also be found in our press release. Any reference to sales in the discussion today is referring to local currency sales, which compares results between periods as if current period foreign exchange rates had been the exchange rates in the prior period. You can access the release and our forward-looking statement language through the Investor Relations section of the company website, where you can also access a webcast replay of this call later today. I will now turn the call over to Miguel for his remarks. Thank you, Jane, and good morning, everyone. Just 13 months ago, along with a new leadership team, we began the process of turning around this iconic company. We committed to right-size the cost structure, to fix the core business, increase the use of digital tools, and strengthen our, the balance sheet. And as you saw in the press release this morning, both our top and bottom line performance along with our liquidity and capital structure, improved significantly from a year ago. But more about the quarter and our performance in just a minute. Let me first reiterate key elements of our strategic growth plan that are well underway. We want to pivot from a distributor push to consumer pool and distributor push model. Update a brand architecture to allow us to segment branding, products, channels, and pricing to appeal to a broader consumer base, expand into new product categories and push consumer permission of our iconic brand, align product development efforts to address needs of all consumer social sub-segments, expand distribution and access points to meet consumer where they shop, and most importantly, fix the core direct selling business with proven methods. Today, in our 75th year, The brand is very strong, widely known, and accepted. And we intend to leverage this important asset. We also believe we're on trend with a worldwide focus on ESG by producing and selling environmentally friendly reusable products. You've seen our increased efforts in this area with the sponsorship of national parks and our use of new, more environmentally friendly materials. Due to the strength and awareness of our brand, we made the strategic decisions to be a branded house, not a house of brands, as we develop our new brand architecture. As such, we expect to divest all the non tupperware businesses this year and use the proceeds to continue to pay, to pay down our debt and continue to invest in the business. We believe the execution of this new brand architecture will enable us to penetrate new channels of distribution, new product categories, and new pricing structures, all of which have the potential to accelerate our growth while minimizing any potential conflict with our current direct selling channel. In the first quarter, 
We reorganized our leadership team around channels, with Patricio Cuesta leading our direct selling business. Hector Lezama now leads our non-direct selling business, which include key markets like China and Korea, along with all the important markets, and most importantly, our efforts to penetrate new channels of distribution. Improving our abilities and expanding our capabilities in product innovation will be a key objective of our executive team over the next two years. We believe there are highly innovative manufacturers around the world that we can strategically partner with to accelerate our efforts to broaden our current product offerings, extend our brand into new categories, and appeal to consumers in different social sub-segments. Also, we believe there is an exciting R&D journey ahead to use novel materials to accelerate our efforts to continually improve the planet. Our EcoPlus line is an example of this. This product line is a revolutionary product portfolio made with sustainable materials. We're adding two new products, launch it container and sandwich keepers with a new material partner, Triton Renew from Eastman. Triton Renew uniquely offers Tupperware the ability to design clear or transparent products with 50% certified recycled content without compromising on quality or clarity. These products with this new material will be launched in Europe in the second half of this year. Our efforts to fix the core business are evident in our recent financial results. In each of the past three quarters, we have reported 20 plus percent year over year growth. While we are up against easy comps, this growth reflects increased activity, higher engagement, and rapid adoption of digital tools and techniques by our sales force. As we mentioned on our last earnings call, a key strategic shift for us in 2020 was that our sales force realized that geography was no longer a hindering factor to growing their business. By utilizing social media platforms and digital tools, they have been able to reach beyond their physical neighborhood and leverage the expansive reach of their online social network. While it is still early in their transition to embracing digital selling tools and methods, we're confident we can build upon the success gained in 2020 and accelerate widespread adoption in 2021. We believe a more digitally equipped sales force will enable ongoing engagement and increase productivity as we move forward with all our other growth initiatives. Our overall digital strategy is making great progress with expansion of Salesforce enablement tools, social commerce, and web servers. Our top 10 markets now have these important tools in order to create a more seamless interaction between consumers and our Salesforce and increase the options for consumers to access our products. Speaking of more ways to access consumers, let me take a few minutes to discuss some new business opportunities. Historically, we have done 30 to 35 million per year in business-to-business -business partnerships. In these partnerships, we sold products to well-known retailers who then use the product in their loyalty programs. Top of our products are then exchanged for points based on consumer buying activity with a major retailer. We believe there are opportunities to expand these partnerships. Currently, we're working with major brands in Mexico, Brazil, and Europe and are evaluating more opportunities for the remainder of the year to accelerate our growth in this channel. Additionally, here in the U.S., we will be testing new channels of distribution. This past weekend, Topper will run a future segment using limited products with a major home shopping channel who has access to more than 92 million homes across the U.S. through various media channels. This new product and brand exposure allow us to deepen engagement around our brand and provide potential leads for our sales force. Additionally, this is an opportunity to reach an expanded audience through the power of storytelling and discovery-driven shopping experience. Just a few months ago, Tupperware became the first reusable plastic container brand to partner with TerraCycle circular reuse platform, Loop. Loop works with leading brands to create zero-waste, durable, and returnable packaging. As part of this agreement, Tupperware has recently partnered with one of Loop's prominent brand partners, and we're currently designing a one-of-a-kind reusable package option for this brand, and it will be available later this year. Another example of our efforts to reduce the use of single-use plastic 
is our partnership with the National Park Foundation. This summer, Topper will, will be releasing a limited edition, specially designed national theme park line of sandwich keepers and on-the-go cups, which will be sold through a National Park Service retail partner available at select parks around the country, as well as through Tupperware's direct selling and e-commerce channels. Also, our donation will help expand access to clean drinking water through new refilling stations. Turning to first quarter results, let me highlight a few of our large markets before Sandra discusses our overall financials. In the U.S. and Canada market, sales increased 83%, and Salesforce activity was up 92%. It is important to note that this level of growth is not sustainable going forward, as the first quarter of 2021 had the easiest year-over-year comparisons. Additionally, we're shifting to more profitable sales in this market, and we will reduce some of the highly promotional programs and improve distribution costs. As we become more consumer-centric in the U.S. and Canada, our customer profile is changing. Virtual selling leads to more people purchasing smaller units reflecting our consumer pool strategy. This change in order profile has increased our distribution cost, and while we accept the higher cost in the near term, we're evaluating ways to embrace the shift into more efficient ways. This is an important market to Tupperware, and we will be working intensely internally with our Salesforce to continue to increase the profitability in this market. Tupperware Mexico had an 18% sales growth in the first quarter on a 6% growth in average active sales force. This market also had an easy comparison in the first quarter of 2021 that need to be considered going forward. While we're experiencing sales growth in Mexico, we're not meeting what we believe to be our potential in this market. As a result, we recently made a leadership change to make sure that we leverage the opportunity of our products, brand, and sales force going forward. The new leader of this market worked with me over the last 10 years, and I'm confident he will be able to work with the local sales force to increase sales and profitability. In Brazil, sales increased 46% on an easy first quarter comparison, and was achieved through an increase in sales force activity of 40%. As you know, the second wave of COVID has hit Brazil very hard. While this second wave has not yet significantly impacted sales, our recruiting efforts have been affected. So we will remain cautious in this market until the trend stabilizes and COVID rates subside. And lastly, a key market in our long-term growth plan, China, which declined 14% as active students were down 7% versus last year. Our new leader in China is focused on improving product innovation, exploring bigger opportunities in e-commerce, and fixing the core entrepreneur-led retail business. The turnaround in this market will take time, but we're confident that our brand is accepted and recognized by Chinese consumers. Looking forward, our key priorities in 2021 to strengthen our direct selling business are the following, digital and product investment, segmentation of our sales force, introducing preferred customer loyalty programs around the world, use of data to identify best practices, use of data to upsell and cross-sell to our preferred customers, and ensure competitive service and cost. And our key priorities in the business expansion are to explore new channels of distribution, avoiding a potential conflict with our current direct selling channel, introducing Tupperware sub-brands and penetrating into different product categories where we know the consumer give us permission to enter. We believe the execution of these priorities is creating competitively strong foundation that will create meaningful value for our shareholders for years to come. Now, let me turn the call over to Sandra Harris, our CFO and COO, for a review of our financial statements. Thanks, Miguel. The strong revenue momentum from the second half of 2020 carried over to the first quarter of 2021, reaffirming the firm financial foundation we are establishing as part of our turnaround plans. Our first quarter sales were $460 million, which was an increase of 20% compared with last year in local currency and up 22% on a reported basis. Three of our top four markets, U.S. and Canada, Mexico, and Brazil, contributed 74% of the dollar increase. Additionally, 
Reflecting the breadth of our efforts to fix our core business, the majority of our markets posted improved sales in the quarter as well. On a regional basis, North America increased 43%, South America increased 53%, Europe increased 12%, and Asia was up 6%, excluding the negative impact from China's decline that you heard Miguel say. These higher sales, coupled with our turnaround plan cost savings, led to a gross margin of 70.3%, 480 basis points higher than a year ago. Of the improvement, 330 basis points was attributable to lower manufacturing costs. The balance of the improvement reflects favorable changes in country and product mix. Like other companies you may follow, we are experiencing higher resin costs, but so far we've been able to offset this negative impact through additional cost savings throughout our operations. Moving on to SG&A. We also experienced tremendous year-over-year -year improvement. Adjusted SG&A as a percentage of sales was 53.9% and reflected an 820 basis point improvement from last year. Right-sizing efforts contributed 560 basis points and 310 basis points improvements are from lower promotional costs. These improvements were partially offset by 50 basis points of higher distribution costs. Looking forward over the next few quarters, to support our strategy to grow in new channels, we are accelerating investments in IT infrastructure to increase our capabilities and enhance our cybersecurity, data privacy, and strengthen our controls. We plan to also make incremental investments in the supply chain to improve the service levels required by consumers in these new channels. We estimate this incremental investment to be in the range of 30 to 35 million for the balance of 2021. Additionally, through approximately 10 million of additional investments in our tax strategy, we believe we have the ability and opportunity to more quickly achieve a tax rate in the low 30s for the full year of 2021. We expect these 2021 additional investments will result in SG&A in the mid-50% range in the near term. Longer term, we will continue to pursue SG&A at sub-50% of sales through an ongoing centralization efforts, creating centers of excellence to leverage our size, simplifying our compensation plans, and through sales growth in our omni-channel initiatives. For the first quarter, the improvements in gross margin in SG&A that I just discussed, combined with our contribution margin on the 20% sales growth, resulted in an adjusted operating income of 75.3 million, or 16.4% of sales, which reflects a significant improvement of 1,290 basis points versus prior year. We made a huge commitment towards cost savings in 2020 and it's gratifying to see it now reflected in our P&L. Now let me turn to a non-GAAP metric, EBITDA. As you see on the schedule contained in our press release, for the quarter, it is 88.6 million, reflecting an improvement of 75 million from last year. In addition to the higher operating income I just mentioned, Q1 EBITDA was favorably impacted by a one-time gain on sell of assets of 9 million, a $3 million benefit related to a grant from the China government normally received in the fourth quarter, and a bad debt reversal in Germany of $2 million. Adjusted for these items and the incremental investments that I just discussed, future quarter EBITDA will be slightly lower than the first quarter, but still above 2020. The improvements in the operations, higher sales and higher margins, led to a gap diluted EPS in the first quarter of 85 cents. This is a dramatic turnaround from the loss of 16 cents in the first quarter of 2020. And adjusted EPS of 82 cents also improved significantly compared to just nine cents last year. The 73 cents of improvement in adjusted EPS includes 69 cents of turnaround plan savings profits associated with the growth in sales and less COVID-19 impact. Seven cents 
related to the China grant and the reversal of the bad debt reserves, offset by three cents of acceleration of interest related to the debt repayment, which I'll discuss in a minute. In the first quarter, our total balance of debt was $695 million, reflecting a reduction of nearly $300 million from the $991 million in the first quarter of last year. In addition to the proactive actions we took in 2020 to reduce and restructure our debt, in the first quarter, we used the proceeds of approximately $34 million from the sale of non-core assets to pay down our term loan debt. The debt reduction, together with strong improvement in EBITDA, resulted in a debt-to-adjusted EBITDA ratio for debt covenant purposes of 2.36 versus 5.36 last year, and well below our required covenant of 4 the debt reduction also triggers a favorable 50 basis point reduction in our new term loan interest rate effective during the second quarter. We expect the rate to decline from 9.75% to 9.25% on $240 million of term loan debt. Achieving double-digit growth for the third consecutive quarter, delivering profits that continue to reflect our right-sizing efforts, and lowering our debt through the proceeds of non-core asset sales, resulting in a leverage ratio of 2.36, are continued evidence that our turnaround plan is working. As we discuss today and as we look forward to the rest of the year, we are shifting our focus to support efforts contained in our growth strategy, and therefore we plan to make incremental investments that we believe will drive penetration and growth into new channels. We are also committed to finalizing the divestiture of non-core asset sales to focus our resources on growing our branded house. As a result, we believe these actions and our strategic plans will create a stronger, more competitive company for the future. I will now turn the call over for Q&A. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you would like to ask a question, simply press par then to number one on your telephone keypad. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Your first question comes from the line of Linda Baldwin-Weiser with DA Davidson. Your line's open. Yes, hi, good morning. Um, can you, um, Sandra, Sandra, just repeat um, the statement you made about EBITDA guidance going forward? I think you said that excluding the additional investment, the EBITDA would be lower, but yet up year over year. Can you clarify that I just understood that correctly? And then can you just kind of comment on the cadence of the additional investment and what the EBITDA would kind of flow including the additional investment? Thank you. Yes, hey Linda, good morning. Um, yeah, so EBITDA in the quarter was 88.6 and the, the adjustments that, that we would make against EBITDA would be the one-time items that I discussed. So one was the nine million gain on sale of, of the French manufacturing facility in Average Lane. There was a three million timing difference on when we recognized the, the China government grant. It typically comes in fourth quarter, so that would lower um, forward-looking EBITDA. And then the bad debt reversal is a one time of two million. And then to your point, you know, I discussed uh, between 30 and 40 million of um, additional investments that we need to make. And roughly those are going to be um, a little heavier in Q2, but then more rateable throughout Q3 and Q4. We're accelerating some of the work around IT, um, specifically to ensure that we're more prepared for the business expansion opportunities that we have with consumers. So enhancing you know, our IT infrastructure around you know, cybersecurity, data privacy, and all the things that are necessary as we you know, approach more consumers and provide more access. And can you clarify too, Sandra, if the 30 to 40 million uh, of investment is is on top of the amount of cost cutting that you expected to come back, which I think that was about 25% of the original cost savings. So this is like incremental that to that that will come back. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. 
Yes, Linda. So we had said that 25% are roughly 45 million. Those were largely either one-time COVID-19 actions like furloughs. Um, but I would also say that the 45 million, even though we had some in Q1, it's also more back-end loaded as we add back in more of the commercial programs, the incentive trips, and and um, commercial opportunities. So you know, and it, for the most part, the 45 million is really hoping, you know, generating and driving more of our turnaround plan cells, whereas the additional 30 to 40 million we're talking about is, is getting the infrastructure prepared for those cells, and so it is incremental to that 45 million. Okay. And then um, as you think about kind of the long term and the turnaround and the longer that the management team has been there, in thinking about further investment beyond 2021, um, are you kind of thinking that there will be some more like incremental type investment or do you think you can work in the required investment in terms of normal operations in kind of past 2021? Thanks. Yeah, and so we did choose to use some of the profit um, you know, that we achieved above based on the higher 20% growth to fund these additional investments of 30 to 40. So we are always looking to balance that, Linda. What I would say is that as we look to really expand into more channels, you know, we have a lot of work that we need to do in our supply chain to be prepared for that. You know, we're going from a distributor model where we had a different, you know, packing cadence, a different shipping cadence to, you know, both a consumer model, which has smaller units per carton, but then also we have, you know, potentially partnerships that, that ship big crates. So we're, you know, we're having to really look at our um, supply chain and choose to make investments. The other piece is as we continue to expand, we need more product for those channels. And um, you know, as we innovate and have more product availability, we realize that most of that will be coming from a, a third-party sourcing situation. So part of the investment that we're talking about this year is to start to build out a robust sourcing organization that really partners with suppliers on you know, obtaining those products, finding new innovations that are in the market. And so we do feel like um, you know, we potentially will augment that as we go forward, depending upon you know, how our sales respond to these new product categories. Thanks. And then in terms of the um, strategic initiatives to get into other channels, um, Miguel, could you just talk about kind of will we see that as, a, as an effect on sales performance in terms of incremental sales in 2021, or is it more a 2022 where we would see the actual sales results of, of, of your actions? Uh, hi, Linda. Good morning. I think you're going to start seeing it a little in Q3, but mostly in Q4 and definitely next year. Okay. And then, Miguel, at this stage of the game, now that you've been at the company, oh, I guess about a year, um, what are you seeing as kind of the biggest challenges to the turnaround? Is there anything that your thoughts have changed versus when you first came to the company in terms of um, strategy or ability to execute on any parts of your strategy? So basically, you know, the, the – the short answer is no. I mean, the, you know, the same strategy is in place. We're very confident in our ability to, to execute. The big challenge that we have, which we knew all along, is that, as you know, we're primarily a direct selling company. And uh, by expanding to other channels, we need to, you know, to build, hire, uh, however you want to call it, these new skills uh, to get into other channels. And you know, there's this is uh, you know skill sets that many other companies have, and that's how they they were founded and grew up. We need to to build them and build them fast. And we're obviously we're going to start with the bigger markets, but at the same time, I think our PNL is going to be able to sustain uh, uh, those investments because you know the whole PNL of these other channels is completely different than the one in direct selling. Yeah, and Linda, I'll okay. just add one more comment to, to that as well. You know, as Miguel said, these other channels will support, um, you know, incremental margins, and we also, you know, are continuing to improve our margins um, as we can through centralization and leveraging. And so, you know, from that respect, back to your question of, you know, will these additional investments be funded, we will continue to look for ways to optimize, you know, across the enterprise to keep our margins very healthy. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from the line of Steve O'Hara 
with uh, Sidoti. Is your lines open? Uh, hi, good morning. Thanks for taking the question. Um, could you just, uh, I know you guys had made, uh, I think, some leadership changes in, uh, I don't know if it was China or in Asia uh, generally. Um, can you just talk about, uh, you know, if, I mean, it sounds like, you know, China's still, um, you know, not performing up to where you'd like it to be. Um, just wondering, you know, if you're starting to get traction with the new management team um, and, you know, maybe uh, how that might, you know, take shape over the next, uh, you know, few quarters to, to years and et cetera. Uh, good morning, Steve. This is Miguel here. So, so obviously, you know, uh, Kane, who's uh, Ken Young, joined us in early February. So he literally has been 90 days with us. And a few of the key things that he's already been working on is uh, he already changed the incentive plan for, for the field so we can uh, motivate the top sellers to continue and the top uh, business owners to continue to, uh, to, to build new, new outlets in, in China because th there was a limitation to 10 per each of these leaders. So now we increase that limitation so that the successful people can be even more successful. Then another, another of the quick things that he is in including in the market is basic uh, retail practices. I mean, such, such as, you know, merchandising, category manager, management, uh, store locations, and so on. And then finally, he comes with a very strong e-commerce background. So he's uh, bringing his, you know, people that he worked uh, with in the past that are only, you know, e-commerce experts, and that's something that is a big, big opportunity for us. Uh, and we, you know, as I said in the script, it's going to take time, but uh, we're very confident uh, that uh, that we're we're setting the right uh, ingredients into the into the market. We have the right management. As Sandra mentioned, we're going to be investing in third-party sourcing, so we're going to get a lot more product into China for the Chinese consumers. So we're very excited about the, our our future in China. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and, and then maybe just um, you know, big picture. Uh, you know, you had a very strong, um, you know, 2020 uh, as the turnaround started to take shape. Uh, and you have, um, you know, I think uh, you know this is kind of the last quarter of, uh, you know, what was a fairly easy comp, I guess. Um, you know, although the you know turnaround continues to uh, work. Can you just talk about, um, you know, maybe you know, longer term, you know, kind of where you see, you know, I think in the past you guys have uh, talked about kind of a, you know, certain level of sales and, and earnings. And, and I'm just wondering, you know, is that thinking still the case uh, either in the near term or longer term? And then, um, you know, maybe what's the, uh, you know, what are the long term goals around, uh, you know, sales, profitability, things like that? Yeah, so Steve, you know, we, we continue to um, not provide guidance just because of the uncertainty still around COVID-19, um, as well as our turnaround plan. You know, we're doing a lot of, of interesting and new things. I mean, it led to the decision to make these incremental investments. Um, you know, what we will reiterate is that we have a growth strategy. And, you know, the growth strategy is not only around growing our direct selling business, which we said we would grow, you know, in the competitive range of what other direct sellers are doing. And so, you know, longer term, what we said is that's usually in the low single digits on our direct selling side. But as we add these business expansion opportunities, we know that those can, you know, grow much faster in, in the double digit range that helps us to continue to grow, um, you know, together um, both businesses and add more to our, our, our revenue. So, um, you know, it is a growth story on the profit side. You know, we've proven that we you know, were able to aggressively take out cost. We we're memorializing that. And that growth will help to fund these investments that we're talking about in the future, and that's why we've chosen to accelerate them. Um, and so, you know, all in all, what we're looking at is a very balanced strategy of, of growth on the top line with continued, um, you know, efforts around ensuring that we have very healthy profitability. And, uh, you know, this, this quarter we delivered the 20% return on sales on our operating margins, and, um, you know, we, we will continue to look for ways to, um, you know, return to investors on, on both metrics as we look forward to the future. Okay, uh, and then just um, I, I know you know, noted um, you know uh, continued effort to uh, you know shed um, non core assets. Uh, can you just remind me where the the land uh, sales uh, process is and and what the timing might be on that? 
Yeah, so um, we do still have uh, one more parcel here in Orlando. We still do estimate the proceeds somewhere in the $40 million range. Um, we're continuing to have conversations with the partner that we did the, the, the deal with last year, it's O'Connor. Um, recently there was a press release that they actually have sold the, um, the, the loan that they had done for this piece of property, which hopefully gives them the ability to uh, you know, work faster on, on executing on the second piece. But we also are in a non-exclusive with them, and so we are you know, continuing to look at you know, any option that's available, and we're committed to the sale of the non-core assets. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Your next question comes from the line of Wendy Nicholson uh, with CDMAC. Your line's open. Thanks. Good morning. Um, first question, if you sell some of the um, non-Tupperware branded um, businesses, do you think you can maintain any of those um, salespeople and just ship them to selling Tupperware? Um, instead of the, the, the brands that you're going to discontinue or, or divest, or, or are they really just going to leave the system entirely? And I'm just wondering um, sort of impact on the P&L, you know, as we go through the course of the year and into 2022. I know its revenues are, are relatively small, but I'm wondering about, you know, the number of bodies. Yeah, so so good morning, Wendy. How are you? So, Hi. so basically once a, a Salesforce member joins a brand, they they work with the brand and they represent the brand and uh, and they're separate right so for example uh, the people that we have in Tupperware Mexico versus the people that we have in Fuller in Mexico they're completely different uh, different sets of people and they're loyal to their respective brands once in a while we we might do a cross brand promotion but generally speaking you know they stay with their own brand uh, I mean at least at the top levels. At the bottom, you know, at the little level, like just brand new people, I mean, as you know, they represent many times four, five, six different brands. So, uh, but that wouldn't change by, you know, by changing the ownership. Got it. Okay, fair enough. And then uh, second question on some of the sustainability stuff that you talked about and, and using the new um, whatever ingredients or products, you know, uh, raw materials for the products. Um, is there any impact notably on gross margin? Are those harder or more expensive to source or will you price up for those or is it neutral to pricing and margin? Yeah, so Wendy, what I would say is, you know, I, I mentioned earlier the incremental investment to build out a third-party sourcing organization. <clears throat> Today, the answer to that would be, you know, we're, we're largely 60% manufacturing, and so we've been opportunistic on, on sourcing. But as we build out this organization and start to form the partnerships with the right suppliers and start to leverage them, then, you know, our expectation is that we can, you know, obviously maintain margin and maybe even improve some of our pricing uh, through the third-party sourcing. Um, you know, obviously, we'll continue to look for margin accretive products to add to our portfolio, and and as with all of our incremental investments, it's ROI driven, right? So we'll make the choices that continue to, um, you know, grow both profit and sales. Yeah, Got let it. me add Fair just enough. a thought. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Let me just add a thought. You know, we're going to be developing sub brands, and uh, let's say if a brand uh, speaks to the consumer around sustainability, and uh, the product cost is, is higher, then we would price it up. Uh, because that's that's just the nature of that sub brand that we're going to be you know offering to the consumers. So uh, so we're going to be very disciplined. Fair enough. And then my last question just has to do with sort of the concept of um, increasing consumer pull. And it sounds like a lot of the investments you're making this year are kind of internally focused on the IT side, supply chain, which is awesome. Um, but in terms of sort of building the brand with consumers, I'm wondering kind of what's your thinking on that, what's your timing on that, and, and is that going to be primarily digital and social media? Um, you know, why not have a Tupperware ad in My People magazine or on the Food Network just to get more people familiar with, oh, gosh, look at those new products. Didn't realize Tupperware was doing that stuff. How do you, how do you think about that, that as a component of the, the consumer poll strategy? So, Wendy, all things are going to come eventually. The, the first thing is that we need to put our house in order. Once we get the right products, the right channel, and we get everything, you know, again, the house in order, then we're going to be able to start investing in different media uh, outlets and channels and, and start doing A-B pilots and see which one works better for us and what's a brand and so on. 
So, so it's in the horizon. We just need to, uh, to finish up, uh, I guess, getting us ready with the, with the whole strategy. Fair enough. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer session. I hand a call back over to Miguel Fernandez. Thank you. We believe we are well on our way to successfully execution of our three-year turnaround plan. During 2021, with our right-sizing organization changes behind us, we're now able to shift our time and resources to implement our growth strategies and become a more consumer-centric company. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. And that concludes Tupperware Brand Score for